Thanks, everyone. Um, I, I assume you've sorted out by now that I am not Dr. Maria Milan. I am Jeff Lomax uh, from the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. So we've got the next hour is a session that's going to talk about, we've, we've said we're going to transition to clinical, so we're going to talk about everything clinical for the next hour, uh, particularly clinical operations on our clinical trial network. But first, I'd like to start by uh, introducing some patient representatives and Andrew and Esther Shore. Got that right? Thank you. And they're going to help frame this session by giving us the perspective, the patient viewpoint. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. I'm, I'm Esther Shore, and this is my lifetime sidekick, Andrew Shore. And we spent just a few decades living through a cancer journey together. Um, we are patient advocates and journalists. We spent a good part of three decades doing patient education in a variety of channels. And um, gonna let, Andrew's gonna talk a little bit. Um, so over the last 38 years, um, we've gotten married, we've raised a family, we have grandkids, we started a business together, which Andrew will talk about briefly, and we've been on Andrew's cancer journey together. And before we get too far into it, for both, on both our behalfs, we want to thank Dr. Jameson for giving us the opportunity to talk to you today. And, I want to thank, and we want to thank every single one of you for the work that you do every day to move medical science forward, to do the research that's necessary to have both of us standing here today. So a little bit about our cancer story. So in 1996, I uh, started having nosebleeds, and it turned out to be something I'd never heard of, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And um, maybe if you're familiar with that illness, often there's a watch and wait, or for us, watch and worry period. I thought I was dead, and we really said I was 45, you know, is that it? Fortunately, it wasn't, and I ended up being in a phase two clinical trial, which added a monoclonal antibody, rituximab, to chemotherapy drugs, and it worked, and it gave me a 17-year remission, and that was great. But then another shoe dropped, which can happen, of course, in uh, cancer, not necessarily recurrence, but another cancer. So I had a lymphoid condition, and then as Katrina knows, a myeloid condition raised its head, and that ended up being myelofibrosis, for which is my uh, leading illness, if you will, today. And uh, you were just talking about scientific innovation and also where there have even been deaths in trials and big pharma runs away. Well, fortunately, people here proceeded to work on fedratinib. That's the drug I take. And I've been taking it for a number of years now as a JAK2 V617F inhibitor, and it's been working pretty well. So I'm very grateful uh, for that. Go ahead, Esther. Now, I was just going to say that despite all that, we have spent most of this time living a very full life together. We just came back from New York City. We just came back before that from a trip to Europe. Um, and we just have, we're so blessed to be able to do all those things as a result of the research that all of you are deeply involved in. Um, why don't you talk a little just, bit about the business so, side of things? Well, only yeah. that we, um, we did get venture capital actually for a company called Health Talk, and then later got some support for a later company we developed called uh, Patient Power. And we said, we're living it can we help other people living with it? So some of you, Dr. Jameson, maybe somebody else in the room, have been on a broadcast for patients. So we started going to medical conventions to broadcast what you're presenting papers and posters and presentations on to the patients living with the conditions right then. Not to doctors, but to patients. And to their families. And to their families, and that developed a huge audience, and that continues today. So we become very devoted to the empowered patient, and that includes people participating in the earliest clinical trials and saying, is tomorrow's medicine today that you're working on, can that help me and offer me hope? And so lastly, I think what we'd say is, 
what you're working on, and I loved hearing what you were saying uh, about investment in oncology, because look, we're living with it, but for many conditions, um, hey, if you can find out what's next, it may not be a cure, but is it what's next? If, our, if the fedratinib peters out or that class of medicines, is there a whole new class of medicines that can allow us to live a longer life? And I would just say that the thing that keeps us both going and our families is that we just want what you're doing to stay one step ahead of where Andrew and others like him are in the progression of their diseases. And if we can continue to live a quality of life together the way we have, then we, we appreciate right. you. Can it be a cure, but even a bridge to what's next, you know, is good too, okay? And so we really want to thank you on behalf of, really, we reach hundreds of thousands of patients in our work. And I know if they're all standing right here, they'd say the same thing. So we just want to say to you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so in the remainder of the time, we're going to do three things. I'm going to do a quick uh, presentation to kind of frame up the session. We're going to have a set of panel questions, which we'll go through. It's, it's quite an impressive panel. I've never moderated a 10-member panel before, so this will be interesting. And then the marching orders are then to engage you all, the audience. So as you're listening, hearing, please formulate some questions for the panel. Okay, so I'm going to start with a little bit of a true story. So one of my hobbies, by the way, is to utilize vintage lenses on modern digital bodies. So it's kind of probably what these folks do in their medical practice. They sort of bedside manner with the latest technology. And this is Emily Reyes, who's the project manager for the Alpha Clinics at CIRM. And what was interesting, I had the pleasure of attending her wedding this July, and I was sitting in this amazing dinner that I think all of Corvallis, Oregon, must have been at the table. It was this huge event. Someone asked me, what do you do? And I was explaining, we, we work on rare diseases and stem cell. I work for the stem cell agency. He said, oh, do you know about this disease cystinosis. And I said, oh, um, yeah, actually, we, we work on that. And I said, oh, well, you, 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 you've got to meet um, Maku, because her daughter has cystinosis. And literally six feet away from me was a, a cystinosis family. And they were, it, it was like amazing. They're in Idaho, and they're completely, they're following our work to the publication, to every, on, on, they're going on clinicaltrials.gov and getting every update. And then they're just going, we're waiting for the next phase of the trial. And it was just incredible, this so, sort of so coincidental to have this just happen. And it was just such a small world, but it really made me recognize, you know, the work that's going on in the Alpha Clinics Network is something that people are really paying attention to, and it's, it's quite meaningful. So on the, you know, this is the, the CIRM mission, but I think it overlaps, you know, incredibly. It, it is the Alpha Clinic Network mission as well to, you know, deliver these treatments. And I'm sorry, I'm looking at my notes. I'm just trying to weave in some of the, the comments from yesterday. And I think, you know, Dr. Weissman pointed out that there's a number of factors at play that cause us to, you know, lose sight of this objective or lose sight of, um, who we're working in service to. So, you know, for me, it, it, it's, it, it's, you have to acknowledge we're not necessarily going to solve the sort of systemic problems for the, uh, for, for this associated with, you know, everything about you know, the medical enterprise. But I think, again, the Alpha Clinics and this, this, this project is really an opportunity to create the conditions where clinical success can shine through in a manner that creates conditions where it's difficult to say no to patients. So that's what uh, this you know, project and this effort means to me in relation to that mission. So again, I think many of you in the room know this, but just to re reiterate very quickly how we operate at CIRM, um, you know, we, we work on sort of the discovery science, that's the first box here, and we've heard you know, a lot of that, the, the first, uh, first part of the 
the symposium, and then we're going to talk about, um, again, our work now in terms of our infrastructure and really del both delivering these treatments and then the work we're initiating to provide opportunity for all, which is very central to CIRM moving forward. Um, just a reminder, this work only happens in partnership with um, our, our awardees um, with and, and that's you know really central. We we have the you know the pleasure and the opportunity to provide the funding, but these are really partnerships that make these opportunities happen. I want to touch on one particular um, program that's about to roll out that we've been working on for about a, a year now because it's going to work in conjunction conjunction with the Alpha Clinics, and that's a. Uh, our Community Care Centers of Excellence program, and the aim there is to provide resources outside of the major academic centers at clinical sites that will really be able to uh, support the, the, the clinical programs. And again, I think a number of the directors here, hopefully we'll touch on it in the discussion, have really been instrumental in imagining ways in which we can partner with community sites and sites outside of the academic centers to really support the broader um, goal of clinical research and um, hopefully the, the ultimately the delivery of approved treatments. The other thing I want to remind us of is that, you know, CIRM, we, we have a number of what we call infrastructure programs. These are programs that aren't targeting a, a specific uh, research on a specific disease area, but they're intended to provide the infrastructure that supports the overall enterprise. And most importantly, you know, the Alpha Clinics is one such um, infrastructure piece. But in addition, all the organizations represented on this panel also have uh, manufacturing awards. And I think now it's, it's in a very exciting time and that we're seeing the, the interaction between the clinical and the manufacturing facilities really coming together at, a, at an incredible time. We, we need the manufacturing to support the clinical, and all these sites have developed robust proposals to make that happen. So the Alpha Clinics, um, I'm going to provide you with a little bit of unpublished data, so no photographs, please, but um, it's actually 236 clinical trials based on the last reports have been supported in the network. And these are clinical trials that are both coming, that receive CIRM funding, but they're also industry or uh, investigator-initiated trials. And again, if some of the panelists may wish to sort of talk about the opportunities there. And in terms of the patient count, we're up to about 1,400 patients, um, again, as of the last report. And the picture you see is really kind of explains, I think, you know, what the alpha clinics are. Often people say, I want to, I often get an email or someone, hey, can we visit one of your alpha clinics? And I think people are expecting to sort of see this sort of the building and maybe it's like get smart, you know, they're going to go through a set of doors and go down an elevator and they're going to be in some master control room. I said, it's, you know, these aren't really, that's not what it is. It, it's people. It's, it's research coordinators, it's uh, pharmacists, it's regulatory specialists. That's what the infrastructure is. It's, it's the people power to really drive the, the operations and the clinical research at these sites. So um, these are a number of the folks who, who make it all happen. And I think, um, I, think, I think that's a photograph by Betty, by the way. So we, we miss Betty. So um, hats off to Betty Cabrera. I know she's um, transitioning, but she's been a huge contributor to the network. Just one other thing, kind of conceptually, it, it, was, it just came up in the last session, actually. I think the quote was, the acceleration in the space is mind-boggling, and, and, and that's a good problem to have. I think one of the things we really aim to do in the network, and again, would encourage um, the, the speakers to, to address how we can do this, is you know, early on, we didn't have a lot of clinical trials, so it, the sort of how you distribute the trials with your capacity was not so much of an issue, but as we're having that acceleration in a diversity of areas and modalities, how can we as a network really rationally distribute those programs in a way where we're really using resources efficiently? And I think 
that's something we're aiming to do in this cycle of the Alpha Clinics program, and I think it's going to be very important from a resource efficiency standpoint. So maybe a cue for some of the, the folks. And then with that, um, this, these are our panelists. We're going to move into a series of questions. Again, I'm not sure how to best manage the panel, but maybe would it, would it help if people just did a very quick introduction just so we know who's on the panel? How, how about we start with that, and then I can throw out some questions. You're probably all wondering why I'm on the panel, but um, I'm uh, editor-in-chief of Cell Stem Cells, Sheila Chari, and uh, we publish some of the work that these great alpha clinics do. Um, hi, I'm Sandra Dillon. I'm, I'm actually one, uh, along with Andrew, um, one of those 1,400 patients that um, the uh, alpha clinics have helped, um, and I'm super excited to be here. <laughs> I'm about to explode. I'm so excited that everybody's here. <laughs> Katrina Jamison, I go by CAT. I'm the director of the Alpha Clinic here at UC San Diego. And I'm Mark Walters. I'm director of the Alpha Clinic at UC San Francisco. My background is in uh, hematology. I'm chief of hematology, pediatric hematology at UCSF. And uh, my background is in curative therapies for hemoglobin disorders. My name is Leo Wong. I'm the director of the Alpha Clinic at City of Hope. I'm also a pediatric oncologist. My name is Daniela Bota. I'm the director of the Alpha Clinic at UC Irvine. I'm a neurologist by training, and my research is on brain cancers. Um, Mike Lewis from um, Program Director of Alpha Clinics at Cedar Sinai Medical Center. I'm a pulmonary critical care physician, and my, one of my chief interests, amongst others, is pulmonary arterial hypertension. I'm Noah Fetterman. Uh, I'm the director of the Alpha Clinic at UCLA, and I'm a pediatric oncologist as well and focus on malignant uh, bone and soft tissue tumors. Hello, Tom Buchanan, director of the Alpha Clinic at the University of Southern California and Children's Hospital Los Angeles, endocrinologist and diabetes specialist. Myrdala Bedi, I'm the uh, director of the Alpha Clinic at UC Davis, uh, and I'm a uh, hematology oncologist at bone marrow transplant. And my background is pretty much on everything from neurology <laughs> to <laughs> autoimmune disorder to cancer to everything. All right, great. Thanks, everyone. So first off, from, from where you're sitting and from your perspective, you, what do you see as the, the, the real novel value add of, of, of the network, of the off-clinic network. And I, I, another way of sort of framing that question is, you know, what are things that you think are, are, are happening and will happen that in the absence of this network would not happen? I'll and, start, Jeff. I'm the newest member of the yep. network, so I don't have the experience some others do. But compared, I've been um, overseeing and developing clinical research infrastructure for 30 years, usually with federal funding. And the biggest difference I've found with the STEM Alpha Clinic program is that um, I think the, the electorate of California um, basically put enough money into this that they're, it, people aren't fighting over the money to do things. We, and the, the biggest difference when we put our grant in is that everybody worked together on how we can do this better as a network. So it's not individual institutions fighting to get the resources, everybody worked together from the very beginning. So I think it's, it will allow people to just do more collaborative research and share the technologies across the network. I think the most important factor right now with nine clinics is the ability for us to accelerate the clinical trials. Everybody knows that enrolling patients, especially in rare disorders, it's a challenge, and having the ability to have a very dedicated group of large institutions working with community practices to identify every potential patient will really make a difference, and hopefully shorten those times from the 14 years that you heard before to maybe you know one, two, or less than three years. Yeah, I think another benefit is that, you know, although the initial focus was a lot on preclinical science and continues, but, you know, the CIRM has funded uh, a number of phase one studies and higher level studies. And, you know, I think that there's now opportunities to collaborate together to move um, trials through phase three into registration. And one of the trials that initially was funded by CIRM, which is, you know, um, 
um, cardiosphere derived cells into shed muscular dystrophy. Um, that's now in phase three studies and heading very, very close to registration. So a novel um, progenitor cell that, you know, for a, a unique condition with an unmet need. I would say de-risking. So you heard the biotech panel talking about how risky it is to invest in new technologies, but it's our moral imperative to do that. There aren't enough new therapies. We heard about the number of diseases that don't even have any treatment or even any diagnostic or prognostic potential. So CERM has provided this de-risking of the valley of death. So instead of having to rely on VC funding, uh, we've actually been able to have CERM fund these aspects of new therapeutics development, new diagnostics development. Maybe it's a new model. It's not even an incubator. It's actually doing this together, developing the pipeline together and with our patient advocates and our editors who insist and publish the preclinical studies. This is in the public domain. So we can get through proof of concept, proof of safety, tolerability, really important, and have um, people know where they're at. I think we're missing Epic for being able to do this together. I just wanted the Epic team to stand because they made it all the way from Epic here. Uh, we've got the people who designed the biggest electronic health system in the U.S. 82% of us are patients on their system. Uh, but maybe we can put our genomics on there and um, have patients have access to that portal to democratize the data so that we can accelerate the pace of discovery and actually know when things aren't working, as Andrew was alluding to. How do you know when you know you should be on the next treatment? So you know these are really important de-risking opportunities. Thank you for doing that. I think before uh, the uh, Alpha Clinic, we all were kind of like working in the silos. Um, and I was working in a silo in my institution by myself, having a few clinical trials there. Uh, and then when we were working at UC Davis, we were working in a silo. Now we're all getting together, as you see right now. And every time, every, you know, every month, every week, we're talking to each other about uh, collaborations on one trials or another trials or moving the things uh, forward. So it has made a huge difference. So I thank you for reminding us we have a patient and an editor here. So, I, I, so, so from what you've heard so far is is this um, does, does it, is there a difference here, or is this just kind of another another funder collaboration? What, what do you what do you sense might be different here, or or not? Well, okay. So from where I sit, very selfishly, I wouldn't be here, like literally. So that is you know, kind of awesome <laughs> without CIRM and without the, um, you know, the research that has happened and been accelerated. Um, but beyond, you know, my selfish opinion, um, it's the ability to go from being a patient where medicine sort of happens to you to being, a, you know, a, a part of the process to you know, to get to inform the process, to get to see the process unfold. And when I made that transition, you know, through the clinical trial, it just opened my eyes to what medicine can be. So we've, you know, out there you talk about like personalized medicine. Well, personalized medicine is, you know, the person at the, at the root of all of this um, effort. And, you know, something is going to affect me personally differently than someone else. And to have a stake and a say in, in how that's going, um, that should be the future of medicine, as well as all of these advances that, again, enable us to, to be here, to be alive, is, is I want to thrive at the same time. So that's my from where I sit. <laughs> um, thanks for this question. You know, uh, what I see being different, um, I want to build on the point that Kat made about de-risking. So when you have clinical trials that are funded by CIRM and um, Alpha Clinic supporting them, they can be investigator-led. And this can really help in terms of transparency when you're publishing IND-enabling studies. So as journals like mine start to publish more of this type of work, we run into issues with companies and IP, and um, it, it becomes much harder to talk about the biomanufacturing of the cells and everything that goes into 
initiating the trials. So this kind of transparency that comes out of collaboration really helps um, surface uh, this type of work. Great. Thank you for that. That's, that's information. That's why we have panels. Um, so you all have a, a, a very good downfield view of the field of, of cell and gene therapy in terms of the, you know, you're, you're actually, you're, you are some of the innovators and you, you, you network with the innovators. So where, what do you see as the, the, the possibilities, particularly in the cell and gene therapy space for the network to, to have the, the biggest impact? Where can we uh, be most impactful, assuming we can't impact everything equally? Where do we put our bets? Okay. Do you mind if I respond, Jeff, Mark, Mark Walters? So um, just to build a, a, a scenario for our, for our own um, Alpha Clinic, we, we uh, participated heavily in industry-sponsored uh, gene therapy trials in thalassemia and, and sickle cell disease, co-led uh, a few of the trials culminating in FDA approval of Zintiglo, which is the gene therapy product for beta thalassemia, anticipate one, if not two, uh, FDA-approved gene therapy, gene editing treatments for sickle cell disease in the next several months. So, so we pivot then to doing the hard work of learning how to do the gene therapy and recruit patients and do it in an equitable way. Now we have an approved therapy. I'm, I'm worried that most of the patients we treat in the United States just aren't going to ever have access or even know about this opportunity. So where we're pivoting now is is in uh, in two ways. One, we're we're reaching out to uh, underserved populations where they live in the community to ensure that they get information about about these therapies and also that we train the next generation of physicians and embed them in these locations where they can uh, do the innovation necessary to ensure that we can actually deliver some of these therapies in the communities where they live. Otherwise, we're just not going to have an impact. So those are those are two ways. Um, that that our program in particular is 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 attacking what I think is is the is the burgeoning issue of tomorrow. Now that we've established some of these therapies, uh, how do we ensure that the folks who are going to benefit from them have access? Yeah, and this is Mike uh, Lewis from Cedar Sinai. You know, Jeff, I think this question goes along with the question Maria put on future possibilities for cell and gene therapy. So I'll also do something from our own institution perspective, and that is something that I can see happening in the future is simplifying cellular therapy. And what I mean by that is that there are different avenues of uh, administration. You can give, you know, stem cells and progenitor cells. You can give products of stem cells and progenitor cells, which is often how many of these um, cells work in a paracrine fashion by releasing all sorts of potent products. And then most recently what we've done at CEDARS is that we've mined the um, exosome of the one of the cell types that we use, which is cardiosphere-derived cells um, that are very potent at, at any tissue or organ level. And we've found that there was very, very high levels of a non-coding RNA, um, Y-RNA, and um, we've managed to manufacture it. The, ad the advantage of this is that it can be given orally. So this simplifies matters. It also simplifies matters, even the stem cells or progenitor cells that we use are non-immunogenic. So that simplifies matters. So I think you know, where we can help um, and advance the field is to simplify regenerative medicine approaches. I want to echo what Mike said and go to a slightly different level, because I think we can be the leaders of also simplifying the regulatory processes. We have so many rare diseases, and the expectations many times from our regulatory agencies are that we're going to run those thousands of patients' randomized studies. And that's not going to be a paradigm that we're going to be able to use to treat rare disorders. So hopefully, with the help of our team and of CERM, we'll be able to have novel guidance about how we can do therapies of one, therapies of two, therapies of 10, without having to go through the regulatory hurdles that we have to face right now. 
Um, I just want to give a different angle because, um, you know, when you're asking that question, how serum can make a biggest impact, obviously you're looking at the, you know, the most common diseases, you know, why we should treat somebody with, uh, you know, ALS uh, versus, you know, diabetes or, or heart problems. Uh, but what actually serum has provided us is that platform and giving us opportunity to work on the rare diseases now we are able to expand that to other things. Let's just say CAR T cells started with uh, you know, lymphomas or leukemias or re relatively rare cancer cells. Now we are trying to expand that to the solid tumors, which is again you know, a huge, huge uh, area of expansions there. Many of these rare diseases, uh, example of the uh, you know, BCR ABLE, is a, CML is a very rare disease. The first tyrosine kinase was, you know, was uh, approved for that one. And at the beginning, they would say, why we should even invest in this? Because it's such a rare disease and we're not gonna make money on that. Now the tires and kinase are like everywhere and expanded from that. So Serum gave us that opportunity. And I think still investing on the principles and learning about these things, many of them start with the rare disease, but then expand to the more common diseases down the road. So I think I agree with everything everybody said here. Um, and from, from my point of view, I think where CIRM and the Alpha Network, um, Alpha Clinic Network, um, in, in my mind, sort of the greatest um, feat will be acceleration. And we, in academia, move slowly, as everybody knows. Our patients, and the Shores will attest to this, don't have time for that. Every day, every week that goes by um, is where are we with this trial, where are we with this therapy? And so to the extent that we can work together to accelerate trials to get from point A to activation to first patient enrolled is I think where we need to set our sights on along with everything else that everybody's talked about. All right, let's, um, I just wanna, because I know we'll, we're getting the, the, hour, the half hour creeps up pretty quickly. Are there any burning questions from the audience? Otherwise, I'll keep going, but I just wanted to give the audience a chance to. Thank you. For someone who does not live in California and who's interested in stem cells, could one of you perhaps give us a concrete idea of how a clinical trial coming to you would really be different step by step, if you will, broadly, from anywhere else? Yeah, can I tackle that one? So I've been involved in uh, the Alpha Clinic Network since it, the inception, and Daniela as well, uh, when it was just UCI, UCLA, UC San Diego, and City of Hope. And we decided, even it, although we're in Southern California, it's still hard for patients to get across these barriers for um, insurance purposes, you know, coverage analysis, things that you think are just silly, but they become big impediments. So uh, we developed an accelerated confidentiality agreement, clinical trial agreement, uh, we're working on coverage analysis, uh, but perhaps more importantly, a knowledge network thing where we started to share ideas, share clinical trials. You can get the treatment here and see Daniela back in her place or vice versa. So it just became extremely integrated and interactive. So now what we all have for our individual alpha clinics, and they're different, they're complementary, is we have a checkbox of activities. If you're coming from Memorial Sloan Kettering and you need this, we will have a checkbox. So uh, Michelle Michelle Ghani has set up our checkbox for our Alpha Clinic, and we have project management. Uh, we've got Peggy Wentworth, who's an absolute master at uh, getting through the regulatory landscape with uh, small molecule development. So it doesn't just have to be cellular therapies or gene therapies. It could be small molecules, biologics, like Ron is going to develop, and um, you know Amy's going to rejuvenate all of us. So you know these are the things that fit in. So we would welcome you to come here, and please use our network. Uh, because what we're finding now is that patients travel. And we're trying to make that happen more. And uh, maybe we can get NICEF to actually fund more in New York. So we have these networks across the country that um, really allow for patient accessibility. But you know that's how we've tackled it. I think uh, I can address it in a different way, also because I have a little bit of experience with your work as we onboarded Claire Henchcliffe, which was nicely listed on your slide, and we are very happy that she joined us in a very strong Parkinson program. 
So the way on which it goes is that you don't always start from zero. If you've been at an institution where you are bringing a cellular therapies or a stem cell therapy, if you are many times outside of California, you have to re-educate the whole institution about what you do. Here, if you reach to one of the clinics, not only that that institution will be very well versed on everything about doing regenerative medicine clinical trials, from the regulatory approvals to connection with patients in the community to recruitment and retention, but depending on how big your study is and how many centers you need, we can offer you a network as small as one center and as big as all nine of us because we probably all have done a similar study requiring similar technology. You don't have to start looking at who else can do it. We can tell you. We can do it, not all the studies, all the time, for every clinic, because we all have our investigators and our specialties, but it's the smoothest landing point that you could, I would say, without modesty for all of us, that you can have for cell and gene therapies. Yeah, and that maybe it just, I, know some, I just want to add to that, because it was, it was a learning experience for me. This, I, I don't know clinical research, but... It was er very early on, there was a trial that had come in, and it was just amazing to see at the project manager level where a lot of the rubber hits the road in, in, in this. The project managers linking up with the, the research coordinators and the knowledge sharing that just disseminated ac across those conversations. They, they happened to invite us in. We, we don't necessarily sit in all the time, but it was just an incredible learning experience because you saw the... The, um, the, the sort of the esprit de corps that really disseminates through that layer. And I, and I think I, I have to imagine, it's my sense, is that it's empowering for, um, for those teams at the different centers because now they have um, a one plus one equals three sort of environment in which to really um, um, do this work. And so that was pretty exciting. So I, I probably cut somebody off. If, if, so please go ahead. Well, just it, to um, reinforce that, we just started hiring our new staff, and I think every single one of you has volunteered to have your analog in your clinic work with our people to get them up to speed on cell and gene therapy because we hadn't had the translational components first. So that's, that's one of the strengths of the network is we can expand talent really quickly. Okay, maybe I'll, is there, I'll keep going. Actually, I did want to come back. You know, the, the point came up about transparency um, on, on, on the data side. Does, does, that, does something like this sort of, oper, op, you know, having an oper, operational transparency, having sort of defined systems like this, does that kind of make a difference as well? I mean, I, I, I assume that comment was more in terms of sort of the data and the outcomes. But on the operations side, is that important from a, a I don't know, a, a, a value side of things? or? Research? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's just um, a... I, in, in terms of transparency, I think it's, regardless of if your project is investigator led or a uh, company led, um, you have to kind of decide at the beginning what you're going to be able to share. And, and having more, it, it's much easier to have more transparency in this type of situation. Like that is something that I've observed. By the way, the only other thing I'd add to that question is, you know, the way CIRM set up as well, these sites can help, CIRM will fund the treatment of patients in California for any clinical trial that's eligible. And again, these sites are set up to do that as well. So the, the Alpha Clinic teams routinely work with our, our, our clinical funding programs as well. And again, we can, you know, they can serve those patients. We can cover the costs of those patients in California. So if anyone's interested in chatting about that, follow up with me after the session. Yeah, I did want to bring up the, the sermtuzumab mm -hmm. and also the cystinosis study. So we did both of those. Sermtuzumab was an antibody we developed with Tom Kipps leading the charge, but it was all CIRM funded actually, uh, hence the name, sermtuzumab. Anyway, it's now called Zilavertumab. It's in phase three registration trials, uh, but that one started here in California, actually here at UC San Diego. I was the PI of the clinical trial. Tom Kipps was the PI of the actual grant. We got it through phase one into phase two. That was a CIRM-funded phase two for Octernal. And then it expanded to being multi-center in the U.S. Uh, 
Uh, so that's another way to get things done. So part of the study was funded by CERN for the patients that were treated here, and the other part was funded by a different funding source. So that's just another way where we can collaborate. Uh, the other one was a cystinosis study, uh, stem cell gene therapy, uh, with Stephanie Cherkey and our team doing data management. But that brought in international patients, because it is a rare disease, even if you meet people in Idaho, Jeff, <laughs> that uh, Some of these um, disease uh, disorders are fairly rare for what you're looking for for clinical trials inclusion. But what I'd like to say, I think what we're moving to is giving the power to patients, back to Andrew's point, patient power, so that they can search what's going on at the Alpha Clinics, what's real. We tend to be pretty vociferous. Uh, but um, let people know what's actually available, because clinicaltrials.gov may not actually be that accurate. And it's very important for people to have transparent, accurate information. And uh, so I think the way we do clinical trials is going to change, and we may use a Bayesian design, where we change it as we're going. So think of what has happened in breast cancer. We don't just do, it's not really ethical to do placebo controlled anymore. And we heard that so well from you, Vivian. You know, sham operations? No, <laughs> that's just wrong. Yeah, sham, no. Sham, sham operations are a sham. I worked with Gary Steinberg on the late neurosurgical clinical trial, believe it or not, as the transplanter looking for neurotoxicity from the immunosuppressive drugs. Uh, but I think we're on to something. This is a completely different way of doing clinical trials. And, you know, for people to know we can move quickly, I think Noah's been a little quiet here. Because Noah will actually pick up the therapy in the parking lot and get it to the patient. <laughs> Do you want to tell them a little bit about that story, Noah? Oh, um, I don't like to brag or speak about myself, but but um, I mean, this was a patient who was dying from an advanced stage Ewing sarcoma, which is something that I specialize in, but I'd rather not. And um, and that's because really no patients survive this disease in recurrence. And um, this patient was a, a patient of, of cats and at, at UCSD, and um, had we had recognized that this patient had this surface marker, and and cat had this drug at, at UCSD, and said, well, we need to get this this patient, you know, could benefit from it. We need to get this in a compassionate use, and um, this is sort of the N of one trial. And who was going to do that? Um, you know, I sort of carefully raised my hand that I would get through basically starting up a clinical trial for one patient. And um, we did that. Um, you know, the, all of the hoops that you have to go through for a clinical trial, I had to go through for one patient and one drug, and, and it turns out only one infusion. But we did that, and that was the last, um, the last treatment that he got. Um, that is not a success story particularly that I like to brag about, but the concept of doing N of one trials is there. And there is, I think, a role for the Alpha Network in, in that. We're treating rare diseases where these patients are not a dime a dozen. There may be 10 of them at most in the United States at a particular time. So I don't know what the moral of the story is there. Thanks for, thanks, Kat, for putting me on the spot. Well, they just, we've got pals here that will step up, even when the going gets really tough, to give people a chance. And, I, you know, that chutzpah, I don't even know how to put it, that was amazing, because John Zay and John Adams and I were saying, well, who's going to do this study? And Noah was going, I, I think I can help. <laughs> so we can do things quickly is the point. We can pivot fast. And that's what CERM has given us the opportunity to do. Maybe the, the owner's responsibility to do. I, I think the question was about the de-risking of the, of the trials. Uh, so it was de-risking for the you know, investigators as well as de-risking for the, for the journal. But also it's de-risking for the patients. Because uh, you know, just heard the story that somebody who had absolutely no choice, now there could have been an option there. But even more importantly, you have seen so many companies have been falling apart lately, especially with these rarer diseases, uh, and uh, you know the treatment stops. Uh, you know, like many other drugs, there, you know, the company just say, okay, uh, it's not going to be financially, uh, you know, sustainable for us. So the product is there; they have the the patent there is going to be sitting in, in in their shelf somewhere and not going anywhere. Uh, now, with these investigator-initiated trials there, uh, 
not only it empowers the investigators to move forward with these things there, but also give the patients at the end of the day opportunity to benefit from these because we are taking that financial risk out of it. I think that's huge. Um, and I'm just going to double down on, on the idea of trailblazing. Like you, you all are participating in this layer of doing things that just nobody, either they don't think it's possible or they don't think there's financial merit and you trailblaze. And once everyone else sees that it, you can do it and that behind that is, you know, so much more opportunity, that's like the, like in my mind, what makes, you know, CIRM and the Alpha, Alpha Clinic so incredible is that you, you kind of are showing the world what, what can be and soon will be, you know, instead of this outlandish one-time one thing, it will set the standard and the expectation, it will normalize. And that's, that's where we all need to go. Thanks for saying that. We, we definitely couldn't do it without partners like you and the other patients in this room, so thank you really for that. Um, and I, I completely agree about setting the standard and trailblazing. I think part of Jeff's question and um, about transparency is that is that we really do need operational transparency in addition to all the other you know data transparency. I think um, most people in this audience are, are scientists, and you know when you publish a paper, you include your methods, right? You come up with some new workflow or pipeline or, or technology. You've got to publish that technique. We're we're writing the protocol now in real time. Uh, to get therapies to patients more quickly and effectively. Um, and I think one of the advantages of doing that in California is that you know we're whatever the fifth largest economy in the world or something obscene like that. So, so when we do something, uh, it really does move the needle for the rest of the country and the world. If we can show that the Alpha Clinic makes things better for patients, everyone's going to follow that. Appreciate the science that was presented yesterday as well as the clinical information today. But my question, perhaps a suggestion too, is when do you think all the work being done will be on human beings only? And will that be an indication of the progress you are making? Maybe I can address this from two points, the question about transparency and the question about human beings. I've been in CERM and Alpha Clinic now for nine years. It's a long time for a scientist. What Alpha Clinics do allow the scientists in our each individual institution to have a direct view, not behind the glass, of how their ideas from the laboratories can be translated into clinical trials. And if nine years ago, a lot of the work that CERMOS funded was discovery work, right now a lot of the work that we are having in our clinics, it's phase two studies, and actually a number of products, as you could hear, are already getting FDA approved or knocking at the door of the FDA asking for an approval. Our role is changing a little bit, in my opinion, because we're also becoming a group working with CERM on pharmacoeconomics, how do you pay for it? On workforce development, who is going to administer it, because it's very different to take it from a clinical trials where everything is very controlled, to being available to any physicians that has a license and want to administer the therapy. So we are inhumans, we are more than inhumans. We are at the level of treatments and cures where from before we were experimental treatments, but that's a pipeline, because there are a lot of things that we haven't cured or treated yet. So we are learning from where we are right now to be able to apply to other conditions and other disorders. I wanted to just get back to one point, and that was about maybe there are some therapies that companies shouldn't control. Maybe because the bottom line is about dollars rather than the bottom line being about people. I, I would like to bring up the concept of the human ROI, the human return on investment. And you know, I think that we have to think about that. I was a bone marrow transplanter. Um, that wasn't funded by companies. That was funded by academic institutions and the NIH actually making sure that we got through the bone marrow transplantation realm and had therapies that were curative. So maybe when it comes to curative therapies or therapies that are going to extend life but have a long time before you see an outcome, 
Maybe that fits better within the system, within a, a you know funded system like CIRM, so that maybe de-risking is continuous and we should have bundled payments. So that's what changed with BMT. Uh, we got bundled payments for looking after one patient. I, when I was a transplanter at Stanford, there was one patient whose husband showed up with a metal suitcase with 350000 in it because it wasn't clear insurance was going to cover the experimental transplant. That's what we need to overcome for people. And so I think that there will be more therapy, Sandra, uh, because maybe if companies abandon ship, we can get them back. Maybe there's a resurrection strategy, not just a regeneration strategy, but a way to get these therapies back that we know work. And maybe there's a way to reinvest in those therapies. I'm just throwing down the gauntlet, Jeff, <laughs> just to be <laughs> provocative. But yeah, This is Mike. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, I think it's incumbent upon CIRM and the Alpha Clinics, you know, to move as quickly as we can to get studies to higher phase um, trajectories and to registration. And I think that's really important, even though we've, you know, CIRM just got funded relatively recently. I mean, we want to continue funding in the future because I think, you know, stopping after such a great start would be a, a tragedy. The one concern I have, though, is you know the issue of cost. And so if you get um, a unique product to registration, I mean, the costs have just escalated. I mean, there's a new drug coming out. It hasn't been approved yet by the FDA called Satadacept for pulmonary hypertension, the phase three study was just reported in the New England. And, you know, th this is given by subcutaneous injection. I'm sure it's going to be astronomically expensive. Um, you know, why it has to be, that's a different story. But I guess people are trying to recoup um, all the funds that they had in, in preclinical research through registration. But I, I really see that as an issue that we need to think about and address because we want to have as wide uh, a population, you know, receiving, you know, life-saving therapies for unmet needs and conditions. And it doesn't have to be rare conditions. I mean, they're common conditions that have unmet needs. You know, just one example would be, you know, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. It's it's very very common, and yet we don't have very effective therapies. You know, it's been it's been quite fascinating. We we had a network meeting, and I know uh, th these are all esteemed physicians, but a number of them I think are moonlighting as economists because there's been a lot of this this theme keeps coming up, and it's um, but there's some real I think thought going in, into this as well in terms of you know there are some opportunities perhaps to you know through this sort of system, through the, the deployment of technology because of our manufacturing, to sort of think of ways to sort of push down those costs. You know, and I, again, I'm, I'm looking at Murdad down at the end of the line because I know he's got a, a few thoughts too. I just maybe would ask, invite you to maybe make a few comments because I know you've really pushed the envelope here in terms of thinking about getting treatments to patients in innovative ways. So perhaps you wouldn't mind commenting. So, yeah, uh, you know, as Jeff said, I'm, I'm a scientist, but, uh, uh, you know, for the last few years, we have been dealing with the economy of these things because, as you know, um, CAR-T sells $400,000 just for the product itself, <laughs> not for the clinical part of it. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, Mark knows about the sickle cell and thalassemia. We're talking about $2.8 million for treatment for each patient there. And just you multiply that with 7,000 uh, sickle cell patients in California, uh, that's going to be you know, a couple of billions of dollars. Uh, and who's going to pay for that? Uh, you know, CAR T cells are very few right now for leukemia, lymphoma, myeloma. Those are very few patients there. Once, it's not if, once it gets to the solid tumors, uh, you know, we're already seeing TILS, for example, get into solid tumors, uh, tumor infiltrating, infiltrating lymphocytes. Uh, and then CAR T cells, again, you're talking about tens of thousands of patients, not just a few thousand patients. Who's going to pay for this? How's going to? So this is not going to be sustainable. So a lot of efforts have been doing in our in our institutions, 
is trying to change the process through the scientific uh, you know, innovations and make the process uh, you know, faster, more cost effective, easier, uh, that it can be done not only in a big uh, centralized uh, farm, you know, uh, pharma facility, but in a small area, you know, in, you know, maybe even in the community center there. Uh, so we are working on uh, not only again the manufacturing part of it, but the other aspect of uh, you know how to work with the insurance companies, how to work with the with the state, how to work with the uh, uh, with the uh, you know community physicians there, and uh, make this doable uh, in again everywhere, and not just few academic center. Great. So. Thanks for, and thanks for your efforts there. So, I mean, as you can see, I think that's the real beauty of a, of, of a, pla of a infrastructure program. Again, not tied to a, a specific project, but really to be able to think broadly about the delivery of clinical care in a really multifaceted way. And again, all these institutions have been hooking up with thought leaders throughout their institutions to really tackle some of these challenges. So we've reached our time. Um, and I'd like to give everyone one more thanks for being here, and I look forward to the rest of the program.